Hello friends, welcome to yet another intriguing edition of Biology Made Easy. Today I'll be bringing you a very ecstatic topic known as DNA replication in prokaryotes. The model organism is Sturichia coli which has 6.4 million DNA base pair of DNA sequence. Today we will be discussing exclusively about the initiation part in the replication in prokaryotes especially in Sturichia coli. Now how does the replication begin? It just cannot begin from any specific DNA sequence. There has to be a very very specific DNA sequence to which the initiator proteins can bind and thereby start off or commence the process of DNA replication. So that specific DNA sequence present in the DNA sequence of E. coli is known as origin of replication. Now origin of replication in E. coli spans 245 base pairs. Now it is mainly made up of 13 mer and 9 mer sequences. These are the conserved sequences. 13 mer means it's the conserved sequences of 13 nucleotides, right? And there are mainly three 13 mer sequences, right? They're also known as DNA unwinding elements, along with a specific AT regions. Now, why AT regions? Because AT bond has two hydrogen bonds, whereas GC has three hydrogen bonds. So it's prudent to say that AT can be dissociated with much lesser energy compared to its GC counterpart. Now we come to the 9 mer sequence. 9 mer means again, it's a nine nucleotide conserved sequences repeated 5 to 10 times. So in many books, you will see 4 nightmare sequences. In the research papers, you will see 5 nightmare sequences. In many research papers that I have come across, I have also found nightmare to be 10. It's 10 nightmare sequences, whereas they are divided into two specific categories known as high affinity HA sites and low affinity LA sites. Now, high affinity sites, there are three specific high affinity sites known as R1, R2 and R4. Whereas the low affinity sites are R3, R5, I1, I2, I3, Tau1 and Tau2. So we can distinguish this between R group, I group and also Tau group. Now we'll come to it just after I explain DNA. Now these sequences are extremely mandatory in order for a specific accessory proteins or initiator proteins to access or to recognize this specific 245 BP origin of replication sequence. Now let's come to the first protein known as DNA. DNA is the first protein to recognize the 9-mer sequence and bind to it. Now DNA is an ATPase, it binds with ATP and when it binds with ATP it does become active. Now the accessory protein associated with the DNA is DIAA. After the association of DIAA with DNA ATP it enhances the cooperative binding of DNA protein so that the dual replication fork can be initiated. Now, DNA ATP, how does it recognize? The methylation pattern, the N methylation pattern on the E. coli DNA must be complete, meaning that it has to be a fully methylated sequence for it to be recognized by the DNA A protein. When it does recognize the sequence, what it does is after that, it will dissociate its ATP into ADP plus PI plus energy by the dissociation of the gamma, phos gamma phosphate bond. Now, after the dissociation of that bond, the energy that is received or that is emitted out is used to dissociate that, that bond, used to dissociate the AT base pair sequences. How? First, it will bind with the 9 mer sequences in the extended conformation. Then it will switch to the 13 mer sequence binding and why binding to 13 mer sequences it will switch its conformation from extended to the compact form, the compact conformation. After that the ATP dissociation will take place, DIAA will recruit more and more of DNA via cooperative binding enhancement and then the few bases will be broken down, means the hydrogen bonding between the few AT base pairs would be broken down. That will lead to the recruitment of another protein known as DNA C ATP combined with DNA B. DNA C is also known as the helicase loader, right? CDC6 in eukaryotes, whereas DNA B is helicase known as MCM, mini chromosome maintenance protein in eukaryotes. Now, DNA C ATP, DNA B, this complex here has DNA C protein, which is known as the helicase loader, and whose work is to act as a molecular chaperon so that it can repress the activity of DNA B or DNA helicase when it's not required. Whereas DNA helicase is a hexameric ATPase, it also needs ATP for its work, for it to initiate the denaturation process. And the hexameric DNA helicase is associated with six monomers of DNA-C in order to load it. Now, 
when dna b encounters the semi dissociated or the partially dissociated you can say few base pairs of at dna b in many books you will read that dna b is a helicase it can dissociate but in prokaryotes what happens is as per the latest research dna b or dna helicase cannot start de novo denaturation on its own means if the bonds are all closed in this 245 base pair ORI if all the bonds are not means they are completely associated then DNA B or DNA helicase cannot start the denaturation process it needs some of the bonds broken dissociated which has already been done it has already been cleared by the DNA A so DNA A has already done its job of breaking or denaturing few AT bonds few AT hydrogen bonds thereby when DNA B encounters the single stranded dna only then would the dna c dissociate its atp from to adp and pi and that energy would be used for this bond to be dissociated and for the release of dna c before that dna c would act like a molecular chaperon and repress the activity of dna b helicase then dna b would get activated and use atp to further denaturate the complete ORI sequence and keep on going then since we know these are all hydrogen bonds needing only 5 to 10 kilojoule per mole of energy thereby there could be a renaturation curve also suppose DNA B is here so in the backwards towards the back end of DNA B there could be renaturation again and then all those ATP which were dissociated by DNA B to break each and every hydrogen bond would go into waste and the cell doesn't waste ATP now what to do the cell has a solution we have ssb protein single stranded binding proteins which is a tetramer in prokaryotes and trimer in eukaryotes ssb is also known as replication factor a in eukaryotes now ssb its function is to bind to these single stranded regions and stabilize it right so that renaturation never happens and it doesn't just block it doesn't block the template reading it just it's it's kind of an intercality agent which, which does not block the template reaching when pol3 is loaded onto the template strand for the formation of new daughter strand of dna now this leads to again the recruitment and activation of dna g which is rna primase so we'll be discussing a lot about dna g and its role in the elongation video when i post it because dna polymerases do not possess the de novo polymerase activity therefore dna g which is a specific rna primase has to synthesize a 10 nucleotide almost 10 nucleotide rna primer so that dna polymerases can access the 3 oh for the enhancement or for the commencement of the sn2 nucleophilic attack and thereby dntps can be added to the reaction and the formation of the daughter strands which will be explained in depth in my next video now some of the other proteins are dna gyrase topoisomerase if we keep on uncoiling or if we keep on denaturing via dna b you would see a what is called tension a tosoinal strain developing in the forward direction right so in order to release those tosoinal strain right super coils negative and positive both dna gyrase is, is a special top, topoisomerase class 2 which uses atp to swivel across and release the torsoinal strain caused by the dna b helicase right so that is the role of top isomers to release the super coils negative and positive both now we have a specific protein known as hu histone like proteins hu protein hu protein is responsible for bending of the dna so that the conformation is proper for the dna a to even access and to make it suitable for it to go from extended to compact conformation then we have ihf integration host factor right integration host factor is also responsible in a variety of ways number one and the most relevant way is there are specific i sites now come to the this sequence nine mer sequences let's analyze r group i group and the tau group r group all the r group can bind dna a atp and dna adp forms but i group and tau group they only bind dna atp forms now it it will the, what is called integration 
host factor it will activate the binding of dna a to the you can say less affinity having i sites that is the work of ihf whereas fis it's a, it's another protein known as factor for inversion stimulation now fis regulates dna a activity in a very specific way the specific way is and a very intriguing way is wherever the i sites whenever the dna a concentration is pretty low what happens is fis would not let the i sites to be bound right it would repress dna a binding to to the i sites so that it can prevent the reinitiation or the early initiation of dna dna replication during the earlier phase during the early phase of cell cycle now we have specific proteins known as sec a that's the last protein which can regulate this entire initiation process the sec a would sequester all the heavy methylated sites gatc heavy heavy methylated sites in the oric so that again it should it will be able to repress the uninitiating or you can say the process of over initiation or the process of reinitiation when the reinitiation is not required because in one cell cycle dna replication has to only happen once not twice so sec a ihf fis they kind of go through the scrutiny process in order to check that reinitiation should not occur should not get commenced at any cost so that's about it i hope you have been able to comprehend the intricate details of the initiation part of dna replication in prokaryotes with the model organism ischemia coli if you have any questions any queries then do not hesitate to post it on the in the comment section below and if you did find the content relevant then kindly hit, hit the like button and also subs also subscribe to my channel biology made easy thank you see you soon